Good morning. So spirituality 101 is basically this. There is a God, and you and I are not him. Sometimes people remind us of this. Sometimes events do. In the gospel today, Peter, James, and John experienced the event known as the transfiguration. They saw their teacher and trend and friend transformed before their eyes and heard God's voice telling them to listen to Jesus, his beloved son. The apostles needed to see this transfiguration and to hear this message from God. Because they really didn't understand it at the moment, they needed to be reminded of it over and over again. You and I need a lot of reminding also. We all have physical, emotional, and spiritual needs that we must be reminded to attend to if we're to thrive and survive. We are needy, which is the name of our current message series, Needy. Today we want to talk about our greatest need, our greatest need of all, our greatest need ever, our need for God. Some of you are probably thinking, of course he's going to say that. He's a priest and this is the church. What else would he say? Or you might be thinking, if my greatest need is for God, then why don't I feel that need more deeply? Why don't I wake up every morning with a deep desire to connect with God at least half as strong as my desire for that first cup of coffee. We can go long periods of time without talking to God or even thinking of him at all. To maintain a habit of prayer for many feels like a major effort, not a need. It may appear to us that there are other people we know who seem to have it all together, and God is not a part of the picture. They're happy, they have a good job and a great family, just no God in their lives. Where's their need? That we're going to try to answer those questions by turning to our first reading. That Abraham is one of the best known figures in scripture. It is considered the patriarch or the father of the world's three major religions, Christianity, Judaism and Islam. Abraham is married to his wife, Sarah, and they have no children at first. It's a sorrowful burden for any couple who wants children nowadays. But back then, it was a huge problem socially and even economically. And the two of them were really old, so their chance of having a child is hopeless. God chooses to begin a covenant relationship with Abraham. Here's how God starts that relationship. He says that if Abraham steps out in faith, as God asks him to do, God will make him three promises. God will make him a nation. God will make him great. And God will bless him. From Abraham's perspective, none of this could happen without a son. So Abraham goes where God tells him to go. He leaves a very comfortable situation and risks it all for his heart's desire. Maybe that's the story of some of us here today. We're here in church today not because we necessarily want a covenant relationship with God, but because we want something better from God. In that way, you and I are really no different than Abraham. Quid pro quo. I'll do this for you, God, but here's what I'm expecting in return. It sounds a bit selfish and self-serving. I suppose it is. But here's the incredible thing about our God. He still accepts us however and whenever we're willing to come to him. 
God promised Abraham a son if he stepped out in faith. And Abraham did, sort of. Abraham obeyed God, but he minimized his risk by taking his nephew, Lot, with him, just in case he really doesn't get that son. We actually see this throughout the story of Abraham. He believes in God and does what God says up to a point. If you're wondering what I mean, read up on the story of Hagar and Ishmael. That Abraham is our father in faith. But if you read this story carefully, you see that his faith is far from perfect. I don't know about you, but I find that incredibly encouraging. We don't have to wait for perfect faith to follow God. It's true that Abraham's lack of faith delayed the promised blessings, but eventually he grew in faith and was given that son, Isaac. Which also brings us the greatest challenge God will give him. At a certain point, as we read today, God says, take your son, your only begotten son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. Shocking for sure, but not as shocking as the next verse, which tells us Abraham started out to do just that. The story proves how dramatically Abraham's faith and trust in God has grown. Abraham and Isaac, a boy of perhaps 12 or 13, make their way to the place proposed for the sacrifice. As they go, Isaac asks his father, here's the fire, here's the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. Another indication of faith and trust. God will provide. The story concludes, Abraham bound Isaac and laid him on the altar. Then as Abraham went to sacrifice his son, an angel of the Lord came and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. A crazy story for sure, but with an unmistakable point. God has led Abraham to a place of incredible faith and trust. So much so that he stands today as the father of faith of most of the people in the world. And it was through his neediness that Abraham became this example of faith to the world's great religions. This is why we can't afford to ignore our need for God. If we're not feeling that need, maybe it's because we're currently trying to meet that need in some other way, in a direction away from God. That's why God will sometimes allow certain things to happen to redirect that need back to him. Often it's when we're deprived of physical needs or we have we're emotionally challenged in a health crisis, suffering a loss or a death, that we find ourselves urgently turning to God. All suffering can help us to become closer to God and finally realize that God is the answer to all our struggles. As the second reading says today, if God is for us, who can be against us? So here's a simple encouragement for this upcoming week. Begin each day as soon as you can and think of it and say, God, I need you. Maybe write it on a mirror, put it on a little sticky note. Just say it every day for the next six days. We can practice right now. God, I need you. God, I need you. Just saying it first thing each morning, you'll already be living in greater recognition of your greatest need. 
your need for your Creator. Knowing your needs and taking the time to meet them is not selfish. It's living in the reality that we are children of God. We are his creations. He made us needy so that we'll eventually come to understand that our greatest need is for him.